I'm Chris Schrader. Uh, I'm CTO of a company called Intent Media. Um, I'll talk a little bit about Cascalog, uh, along with um, a bunch of the data processing languages that we played with over the years at Intent Media. Um, and if you have questions, feel free to interrupt me at any time. Just raise your hand and, and we'll go through it. Um, Um, so just a quick overview of what I'm going to talk about, uh, a little bit of history of how we do data processing and intent media. Um, I'm going to go through quickly sort of the hello world, uh, how you write hello world in some various data processing languages, uh, a quick Cascalog overview. Um, I have a, a, a demo ready. I should know better than to do that during talks, but uh, I'll, I'll, I'll have sh or show some code if we have time. Um, and I want to talk about a little bit about the future and, and where I think we're going. Um, before we start, uh, who in here uses Hadoop? Who in here uses Clojure? Who uses both? Just me? <laughs> okay, cool. Uh, that gives me a good uh, basis to start with. Um, so, like I said, I, I'm Chris Schrader, I'm CTO uh, at a company called Intent Media. Uh, we're in New York City. Uh, what we do is we work with uh, travel websites to process a bunch of data um, and try to figure out, you know, basically what your behavior is going to be on the site and whether you're likely to buy something or not. So this is a screenshot from Orbitz, a slightly doctored screenshot from Orbitz earlier. Uh, but uh, this was a flight search, uh, New York to San Francisco. Uh, this is the results that show up in the middle. Um, and if we think you're not going to buy anything, uh, we serve an ad to take you to other places. Um, we work with uh, most of the major online travel agencies, hotels, airlines, that sort of thing. Uh, so if we knew that you were a United frequent flyer, this might be United ad and take you right to it if we thought you weren't going to buy an Orbitz, that sort of thing. Uh, try to balance transaction revenue with media revenue on major e-commerce websites. Um, We've been around for about five years. Uh, we've collected uh, terabytes of data. Um, can't say exactly how much, but uh, uh, a bunch of terabytes from all of our different partners. And, and we build models, uh, like I said, sort of propensity to buy, propensity to click on an offer that we serve to you, uh, all these different things. And, and one thing that has been a learning experience for me is um, I came from a very traditional developer background, building engineering teams, that sort of thing. And, um, learning how to do data science and how to build a data science team has been a big learning experience. When you look at this space, there are you know, 50 different options out there. If you have a bunch of data and you want to process it, there's, there's endless ways to do that right now. So narrowing it down and figuring out how to best uh, sort of process your data and interpret it is, is a big problem in and of itself as you build up sort of your data science muscles. Um, so here's a quick history of uh, data science um, at Intent Media. Um, we originally started with the Hadoop Java API. So the way I think of Hadoop, and this is sort of a, a, a very high level abstraction, is there's a distributed file system at the bottom. This is where you store all your data uh, across a bunch of machines. Um, on top of that is Hadoop MapReduce, which is the scheduling layer, uh, resource management, data <coughs> processing layer. And then there are a whole bunch of APIs on top of that. But five years ago, there were not a whole lot of APIs on top of that. There was the Java API and a few other sort of beginning uh, APIs that we started to play with. Um, just to give you guys a quick uh, example of this, no, I don't think anyone uses the Java API anymore. I think maybe a few people do. Um, it's, it's painful. Uh, uh, this is some code. This is a uh, mapper. What this is doing is, is mapping anagrams. So one of the things that's really hard about using the Java API to do work is you have to take every problem that you're trying to solve and turn it into a map step and a reduce step. So if you want an anagram, the way you do that in MapReduce is to take every word. So this is pulling in a bunch of words, sorting all the characters. Uh, so if you had words like beta, you would sort it to abet. Uh, if you had beat, you also sort it to abet. And then uh, in your reduce step, you combine all those up and look for a count greater than or equal to two. It's not a natural way of thinking about problems. You have to take every problem you have and sort of recontextualize it in your head. 
to fit this model as you go forward and, and spread things out. It's very difficult. Uh, it, we had a lot of trouble with, with sort of doing that. Um, so either we're not smart enough or it's just very difficult to do. Um, so downsides of the Java API, hard to write. Uh, need to think in this map reduce paradigm. Uh, hard to test. Uh, I didn't point out totally here, but these implement a bunch of interfaces, the reducer text, 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 text interface. Um, if you want to mock this out and unit test it, uh, there is a, something called MR unit, but it's, it's kind of a pain in the ass to use. So uh, basically, the way a lot of this stuff tends to get tested in my experience is just run it on the cluster against a bunch of data. So you're spinning up clusters, you're working with it. Uh, it's, it, was, it was a big pain for us. Um, and it's hard to read and understand when you go back to it in the future. This, uh, this anagram example I just showed you, um, I first looked at probably a few years ago, and I went back to it a few weeks ago when I was thinking about this talk, and I had no idea what was happening. I had to sit and look at it for you know 10 minutes before I was like, oh yeah, we're sorting the letters and then figuring that out, and I had to sort of run through it in my head, right? So um, it slows you way down when every time you want to look at code that's six months old, you just have no idea what's happening there. Um, it's really too low level. I mean, you can think of this sort of as uh, the assembly language of Hadoop, if there is uh, an equivalent. Um, so the old axiom, uh, there's no problem in computer science that can't be solved uh, by adding another layer of abstraction. Uh, we went ahead and, and added another layer of abstraction on top. Um, and the first thing we tried was called uh, Apache Pig. Uh, it's a project out of Yahoo. Uh, it's a declarative language that reduces to MapReduce queries. Uh, it's a little simpler to reason about. It makes a problem. You don't have to take a problem and turn it into a MapReduce paradigm. You can just work with it. Um, and a big thing for us was uh, things a language can't do uh, can be done in user-defined functions. So as you're working with it, you can write a function in Java or Python or Ruby and spin your code out to it and process it through there. Um, plus, it has this little pig wearing overalls logo, which everyone seems to like, riding the elephant over there. Um, here's an example of a very simple uh, pig query. Uh, this is uh, just data normalization. So uh, what we're doing here is we have a model called BTL. Uh, we're going to pull in a bunch of signals. We're going to group them together. Uh, and we're going to generate some tuple variables uh, and spit it out the other end. Uh, this is an example of a user-defined function. Uh, one problem we had with pig is that this is sort of their made-up language. This is called pig Latin. Um, when you want to go outside of pig, you, you end up bringing a user-defined function. This tuple variables function look like this. I can't read it either. Um, <laughs> But uh, it, it just caused a bunch of problems. We were, uh, because pig defines its own language, you don't have very good tool support. Um, maybe it's gotten better, but generally we found uh, very difficult to work with and use in tools. You can't refactor it. It's hard to test uh, things. It's hard to blow out one of those lines that I showed you a couple pages ago. Like, how do you, you know, test this as a unit? It's difficult to do. Um, when you spin out those custom operations to Python or Java, we had many instances of, uh, you know, you're th if you're not thinking about distributed computing when you write that JavaScript or that Python script and you have sort of somewhere where there's a lock, all of a sudden you're not doing MapReduce anymore, right? You have a method that should just be processing data. If you do any manipulation of that data inside of it, uh, all your data locks on that point and, and you have a big problem there. Um, and again, this is, this is hard for us to unit test. You ultimately ended up running it on the cluster most of the time. Um, so we started looking again for another level of abstraction. Uh, we looked into a project called Cascading. Um, Cascading is another Java data processing library that runs on top of MapReduce. Uh, it thinks of your data as a stream. So it takes your initial set of data, uses a tap, pulls it in, puts it through a pipe, and then sinks it out to something on the other end. It's a more natural way to think about a data processing pipeline than a bunch of MapReduce steps as you go through it. Um, and it has a bunch of built-in functions for common tests. Pig has this too. Uh, and, and you'll find as you move up the abstraction level that you'll get more and more built-in functions. You won't have to rewrite them from the ground up. Um, 
here's some of the built-in operations. This is what you would expect um, when you're working with a bunch of data. Group buys, outer joins, left joins, things that come from a, a more database background, what you want to do with data 90% of the time. Um, here is uh, Java, uh, excuse me, cascading uh, Java file um, class, I suppose. Uh, I don't know if you guys can read it. These are taps. These are the fields we're pulling out of the data. These are pipes. Uh, and there's a sink at the end. So this reads a lot better than what we've seen so far. It reads actually kind of at the same level of abstraction as the pig script, but you're using a real language here. You're using something you can write in your IDE. Uh, you can refactor it. You can sort of tell what's going on. And you can start to break it down and, and unit test a lot of this stuff. Um, but we, as we were looking at this, we sort of thought, we can do better, and going back to another layer of abstraction. Um, cascading has uh, a bunch of uh, language adapters built on top of it. Uh, so there's a Scala adapter. It's called Scalding. Uh, there's a closure adapter. It's called Cascalog. Um, I think that there is a Ruby adapter, uh, and I think there are a couple more. There's definitely a Ruby MapReduce library. I don't know if it runs on top of cascading anymore. Uh, but we uh, have, a, have about a 10-person data science team. And, and we looked at everything. Um, we found uh, an interesting effect, which is we have a, a mix of people with a very strong math background, um, come from a PhD background in math, and then people from a, a very strong engineering background. And uh, one thing I've found over the last four or five years as we've been doing this is if you have a functional programming language, it makes a lot more sense to guys from a math background, which I think is kind of intuitive when you think about it. They're used to looking at functions all day long uh, when they got their PhDs. Uh, you put them into uh, an, an object-oriented programming language, and they, and they sort of go, OK, I can do this, but you don't get the same productivity level you get out of them. If you can just give them a bunch of functions, they can string together. They know what the input is. They know what the output is. They can just figure out how that's going to work. Um, so. We use Cascalog. Uh, Cascalog is written in Clojure. Um, Clojure is a Lisp that runs on the JVM um, and also on the CLR and also on JavaScript. So you can write everything from your uh, server code to your front end code to your Windows code in it if you want to. Uh, but uh, the great thing about uh, one of the great things about Clojure is it has great Java integration. So if you want to do something, that you know, if you picked up common Lisp or, or some sort of more esoteric version of Lisp and there was no library for it, uh, you'd have to write it yourself. Uh, Clojure, you can open up any Java library and just use the Java functions directly from Clojure. So you can sort of go across the barrier and use any of that stuff in your current code base, which makes it you know, very easy to adopt. Right? I mean, there's no fear around. You know, what if we have to suddenly process a bunch of XML files? Will we be able to do that? Yes, you will, because you have full access to all of Java under this behind the scenes. Um, one common reaction to uh, lists, though, is whenever you say lists, people think of this sort of thing. Uh, lots of parentheses. Uh, we haven't had a problem. The tooling around it, uh, IntelliJ uh, has pretty good support at this point. Um, we had a bunch of guys, like I said, who were sort of PhD mathematicians. Uh, so they were used to using Emacs anyway. So um, it, it worked out well for us in this space. Um, but uh, it's a lot different. You know, you can't, uh, one thing, we looked at Scala. And it, it seemed to me that you could write bad uh, Java in Scala. Uh, you could make stuff, a Scala that looked a lot like Java. Uh, you can't write stuff that looks like Java in Clojure. It's a total mind shift in the other direction. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, and, uh, you know, one thing, this is a quote from uh, Paul Graham, who, who runs Y Combinator. Uh, they said if they wrote their software in lists because uh, they'll be able to get features done faster than our competitors and do things in software they couldn't do. Um, we have a 10-person data team, eight or actually, I think, nine-person data team. Uh, we know that some of our partners have you know, 5x, 10x data teams that we have. And uh, for some reason, uh, we tend to have models that perform five or 10 times better than them. 
And we know that because they've told us that, and then they ask us how we do it. Um, and we do it because we have uh, a whole bunch of uh, list functions that we just thread together, and we have teams that can iterate and move really fast on it. Like We've really concentrated on, on our tool set so we can move fast here. Here is a Casco log example. Um, so one downside of this is you have to learn closure and you have to learn uh, data log. So data log is a uh, declarative language uh, that you know is the equivalent to SQL in logic terms, but uh, uh, not a lot of people are actually familiar with it. Um, I'll just let you guys absorb this for a second. I'm going to walk through in depth here in a few more slides on what's happening here. But uh, uh, just to give you a quick overview, uh, we work in uh, add calls and clicks. So we pull them in here. Uh, we split them out into vectors. Uh, we sum up some amounts. Uh, and then we don't really care about the amounts. We just want to see if it's a 1 or a 0. So uh, I'll walk through an example with this code here in a few minutes. Um, data log I already said something about. Uh, it's a declarative logic program language that is syntactically a subset of Prolog. Does anybody know Prolog? OK. Wow. All right. Seven people, more than I would have imagined. Um, it's, it's the sort of thing that sort of bends your mind the first time you, you see it. Um, it, it, it. You just tell the computer what you want, and it figures out how to get it for you. You don't have to worry about left joins or right joins. You just say, um, you know, user first name, user last name, uh, give me user first name and last name, and it figures out how to join the users together. You can say, you know, user company, right? And it'll figure out how to pull it all together. And you can say, Give me, start with the company and then show me all the users there. And it figures out how to join the data behind the scenes to, to give you everything. Um, it's, it's, it's way too much to cover here. Uh, and it's definitely, the one downside, the big, biggest downside of this is, is people coming up the learning curve on this. It takes, takes a few weeks to a few months to really figure out everything that's happening here. Um, so that's a whirlwind tour of our history with this stuff. And I'll dig deeper into some of this stuff as we go forward here. Um, I want to give you guys a quick uh, uh, tour, though, of each of those things I just talked about uh, with the sort of hello world of, uh, of uh, Hadoop, uh, which is a word count example. We don't do hello world in Hadoop. We do word count. So um, every single Hadoop framework implements Here's a bunch of text files full of words. Tell me how many words, or how many times each word occurs in all the files together. So uh, here's it, this in SQL. I'm assuming everyone knows SQL. Uh, but it's basically select all the words from the words and group by the words and give me a count at the end of the day. Um, here's this example in Java, the first thing we talked about. Uh, I can't read it either. but. Uh, it's, it's, like I said, this is assembly language of Hadoop. You're, you're pulling together. This is a mapper. This is a reducer. You've got to thread everything together, uh, pull out all the words. You have to decide whether you're going to count them here. Uh, this, this isn't counting them here. It's just if you took this phrase, hello world, by world, uh, it would count each of them once. Uh, combines them over here. Um, an optimization would be to add them up here uh, on the mapper and then re-add them again later so you don't have to go through the entire list. Um, those optimizations are taken care of for you in most of the higher level frameworks. You don't have to worry about where to put this, uh, generally speaking. Um, here is word count in pig. Load a file. Um, flatten the file, tokenize it out into words, group by word. Uh, for each C, generate, or sorry, for each D, generate a count, and then store it out into a file somewhere. So uh, you know, if you squint at this, you can see SQL, right? Uh, they're similar to SQL, uh, but it's kind of its own thing and, and its own language. Um, this is a word count in uh, Java version of cascading. I apologize for all the comments in here. I should have taken them out. But again, it's, uh, this is where we're pulling from, what file we're pulling from. You create a pipe. You create some assemblies, a group by, and each uh, aggregate. So you have a new count here, new every, and then uh, spit it out of the other end. So again, this is like more the way you want to think about these problems instead of the, the Java thing that we looked at on the slide before this. 
And this is work out in Cascalog. Um, so again, back to the, the data log uh, stuff here. Sentence is just a group of sentences, so it's a separate definition somewhere. Um, this says take sentences and put it into line. This says uh, for each of those lines, tokenize out everything and put it into words. Um, and then this counts all the words. And it knows to join that together with this because the output we want is word and count, right? So this function is going to fill in this with all the possible words. And then this is going to say, all right, well, let's just roll that up. It's just a higher level function that works across the, the first level of output here to roll up a count at the end. Um, this is a query generator. So you can set up a bunch of different queries uh, and join them together. And then this causes execution. And this is your output to standard out. You can have a file in here, whatever you want. Um, but basically, we, we uh, construct a lot of queries like this. And then we combine them together and, and execute them to do what we want to do. But you can test them in isolation. You can build up small queries and aggregate, ultimately, your output at the end of the day. Um, oh, and just for completeness sake, there was a, this is a function. Uh, and this is the definition of the function. This is just uh, tokenize, take a line, and split out into words, just like we've seen in all these examples so far. Um, so I'm going to go right from those hello world uh, examples, right straight into a Casco logo review. Um, I'm going to give credit to my head of data science. This is actually a talk that he gave uh, and I've stolen and embedded inside of my talk uh, and redone a little bit. So uh, his talk's actually here. Um, this is the function that we saw earlier, uh, the generate model data function. And I'm just going to walk through it sort of line by line. Um, these are pre-aggregators. So these are generators. These pull in things. Uh, this takes add copy and turns it into impression ID and add copy, which you can see here, impression one. Uh, add copy by this product. It's a really great call to action. Uh, does this for all the different ads, so impression two, impression three, impression four. Uh, this does the same thing for clicks. So it takes the click IDs, the impression ID, uh, purchase amount, and puts it over there. Um, and then uh, the next thing that Cascalog is going to do is, is join these together uh, just because. Uh, this is impression ID and this impression ID are the same thing. So it figures out that uh, impression one uh, uses this ad copy and spits out, uh, uh, sorry, there shouldn't be two nils there, should there? Oh yeah, sorry, and, and joins it with the click. So this impression joins with click two, this impression joins with click three, this impression joins with click one, um, and ultimately puts out the purchase amount at the end. Uh, this is another uh, aggregation upwards uh, where we're doing a word split. So these are the same things. We're just splitting out uh, the name by this product into a vector or great deal into a vector. Uh, this sum does an aggregation. So we just roll things up, uh, impressions, words, uh, and the amount spent there for each click. And then uh, maybe if we wanted to, uh, a lot of times we don't care that this cost $100 or 100 cents or whatever that is. Uh, we just need a binary number. So this is just a function that does two binary, gives us minus one or plus one. And then these are model data that we feed into our model. Uh, it's data that's been processed. But um, this would have been uh, a lot of uh, explicit joining or a lot of explicit code to get to this point uh, if we weren't using Cascalog. Do I want to do this? This is always a bad idea. Do it, do it. All right, all right. Let's see here. So, oops, where is this? <coughs> okay. This is Emacs. Uh, on the left here, we have a really horribly wrapped version of what we just saw. This is add, copy, and clicks. Uh, and this is the generate model data function. And Normally, if you have a screen with enough real estate, this doesn't wrap like this. But you can just trust me, it's the same function. 
Um, this is just a REPL, a closure REPL, so this is where I can just run code. Um, and this is output, which hopefully will show up here if it actually works. Um, so if I do this, um, you can see here that you know, I'm just running that function. Let me see if I actually get to the output here at the bottom. Yep, oh, scroll back. Um, here's similar output. This isn't exactly the same code as before, but this is sort of your output. I'm just outputting the standard out in this case. But you can see here, if you look at sort of what scrolled by, this isn't just running a function on this data. This is actually spinning up uh, a local version of Hadoop in the background and feeding this through a bunch of mappers and reducers locally uh, that quickly. So you can test all this stuff uh, just using things like this to, to feed it out the other end if you have example data there. Um, and the output looked correct, so that actually worked. I think that's the first time in a talk that a demo has ever worked. So it's super simple. <laughs> Um, uh, here are some Cascalog uh, operations uh, that we use. Uh, Built-in filter operations, you can, you can have a limit, so you can have everything below a certain number. You can have fixed samples, you can reparse data. You can take the first n number of, of uh, values out of something to, to remove uh, peaks and spikes in data. Um, there's a lot of aggregation, averages. You can count things. You can count things with nulls or without nulls. Um, you can have a distinct count for things, maximum, minimum, sums, the, all the things you just sort of expect from a data processing framework. Um, higher order functions, uh, any, all, each. You can write functions uh, with anything that you'd sort of expect in sort of a high level lispy like language. Um, and this is sort of the workflow we follow. So we take a sample of our data set. Uh, we write some functions. We unit, unit test the functions individually, right? Uh, you know, one of the things I, I said earlier, uh, you know, testing the Java piece or testing um, uh, some of the older code, some of the pig code, you had to run the whole file. It was hard to break things out and say, I just want to test this line. I just want to test this function and make sure it's working correctly. Um, then you can end-to-end -end test the whole workflow. Uh, and then we just push it straight to our cluster and, and run against all the data to see if it works. Um, one thing we found here is we used to do a lot of work um, when we used, especially when we used Java and, and to a lesser extent when we used Pig. Uh, we do a lot of this work initially using R or Python or something like that just because it was easier to reason with, right? You didn't want to go into, you know, figure out what the map produce algorithm was for something when you didn't know if it was going to work. Um, We've really converged on uh, sort of one workflow at this point where the experimentation uh, the data team does is really the same thing that pushes to production at the end of the day. And I think that's one of the big advantages here. Um, like I said, we have eight or nine uh, data scientists, uh, and we have probably 15 to 20 different model variations out and running and being tested on different partners at any given time. Um, it just makes it super fast to do all these, and, and you can imagine as you build up a library of functions and start to learn what they do, you just piece them together and change a small thing, and that's how you get to the next thing. Or you worry about um, just working on one thing instead of reading an old pig file, copying it over, you know, pulling the pieces apart, that sort of thing. Um, here's an example of how to test some of this stuff. So this, uh, I showed you the example of uh, testing it in a REPL and, and actually spinning up a dupe cluster. Uh, what this does is if you imagine that max followers query has a bunch of queries inside of it, um, you can say, all right, well, there might be a complex subquery. I don't want to run that. I can just say provided that this outputs this. When I run this function, it should produce this. So this is your check here. This is where you try to figure out what it's producing. So you've sort of mocked out this function inside of here and then run this function knowing that this is going to return this inside of here and verify that it produces uh, rich has the most followers. But again, it makes it much easier than before to unit test a lot of this stuff. You don't have to worry about spinning up clusters and figuring out how to do these things. Um, the other thing uh, that we use a lot is, is something called checkpoint, which is just kind of what you expect it to be. Uh, you can build a workflow. Uh, so this is just step one, step two, step three. This is kind of a contrived workflow. Uh, but 
each one of these steps stores its output somewhere. So you can imagine um, we have uh, you know, MapReduce jobs, Hadoop jobs that take eight hours and 12 hours. And if they die in hour 11, it, it's you know, not a productive day, right? Uh, or people leave and come back the next morning and, and see what's going on, right? So this gives us sort of run the, you know, normally what happens when you're doing a lot of map reduce Hadoop stuff is the first step takes all the data and squeezes it down into something small. So you want to write that somewhere, and then you want to be able to start again from there and, you know, not worry about rerunning step one when you could just run through step two or three. So this gives us the ability to step through these pieces, and then if it dies, in here, we just start here again and we figure out what the problem is and fix step two, uh, which has been very helpful on a number of uh, occasions. You know, one thing that's good and bad about Hadoop, so we use uh, Amazon Elastic MapReduce. Uh, one month, a, a few months ago, we used 5.3 years of CPU time uh, on Elastic MapReduce. People were spinning up uh, 50 machine clusters, 100 machine clusters, which is expensive. <laughs> uh, but uh, uh, we've sort of shut that down. But you know, this this makes it so easy to spin off a bunch of jobs uh, and just, especially if you're using Amazon, spin up 20 machines, spin up 50 machines, spin up 30 machines. Uh, that's one thing you have to watch uh, as you dive into this, especially if you do things in that sort of way. Um, so I just want to talk a little bit about the future of where I think some of this stuff is going, which to me is uh, how can we move. Uh, even faster. Um, you know, a lot of what we've done is, is move to a higher level of abstraction at the top level so that we can develop faster. But then when you actually want to use this stuff, you, you still have to wait for a giant MapReduce job to, to occur. Um, this is a quote from Dave this morning that I've heard before. Uh, Hadoop is the EJB of data processing. I think he means Hadoop uh, MapReduce. Uh, so, you know, we've already built this little layer cake here of everything we do. Uh, next up to me is, is how do we replace that piece, right? Like, that's the slow piece now. We can iterate the hell out of models, but we still have to, you know, when we actually want to operate on several terabytes of data, we still go home. Uh, at the very least, we go get a long lunch. And uh, it's really the point where, you, where a lot of your feedback slows down. So um, a lot of work at this point is being done in that space, and there's some stuff that we're pretty excited about. Um, in December, uh, Cascalog 2.0 was released. Uh, Cascalog 2.0 takes that sort of high-level abstraction that we use and can output to other backends. So it can output to Spark uh, and Storm. Storm is sort of a real-time processing, uh, big data processing framework, uh, and of course, cascading. Um, Spark, uh, the hyperbole on the Spark website says, run programs up to 100 times faster than Hadoop MapReduce in memory, or 10 times faster on disk. Uh, we're setting up a cluster. I haven't seen it yet, but uh, I think there's a lot of potential here to, to just move faster and really almost interactively start to work with your data. Um, at the same time, last week, uh, Cascading 3.0 uh, was announced. Uh, the big feature of Cascading 3.0, different backends. So, uh, they're, they're targeting Spark, uh, Storm. Tez is another layer, another Apache project. I think these are all Apache projects. Like Apache has probably 50 different things in this space, and figuring out how they all fit together is mind-boggling to some extent. Tez is another, if you go to the Tez website, it says we're going to increase the speed of your queries in order of magnitude. Everybody's really worried about that first order of magnitude right now. Um, but cascading is doing the same thing. So either you can use... Uh, uh, you can use your Cascalog and output directly to, to Spark at some point soon, or uh, we can wire it up to Cascading 3.0 in the near future. I think this is coming later this summer in order to output to here. And again, have, have closer to real-time uh, data processing stuff. And these are big jumps, right? Like if you have to wait eight hours and it goes down to 30 minutes, it's, it's a huge, it's, a, you know, it's 16 models a day instead of one model a day, right? And, and those are big jumps forward and big movements in the industry. I think eventually uh, where we're going to end up is data processing time is going to continue to decrease, hopefully by orders of magnitude. Everybody's working on, um, you know, let's make this really fast and let's make it look more like SQL. You want to be able to use, um, uh, you know, 
10, 100 terabytes of data on a couple of boxes and, and sort of real time manipulate and use that data. And, and that's sort of the holy grail, I think, of all these data processing companies right now. Uh, and I think for those of us who, who don't want to use SQL, uh, we'll be able to write our data processing code at high level abstraction and then you know, let the system figure out the complexity. Is this, do, am I going to be able to have enough data here to use this uh, sort of in real time? Or is it so much data I need to use my MapReduce backend, right? Like, you don't have to make that decision anymore. If you want to, if you want to look at 100 years of data or wherever we're going to get to eventually, you know, you're just not going to be able to do it on one box. So you're going to have to spit it out into MapReduce, right? But you shouldn't have to, you should be able to use the same code to sort of real time manipulate data as you would uh, to manipulate, you know, uh, petabytes of data, that sort of thing on the back end. That's all I've got today. <laughs>